In this video I'm going to be analysing the poem Pity Me Not Because of the Light of Day by Edna St Vincent Millay. We're just going to shorten the name to Pity Me Not, which is absolutely fine to use when you're writing your essays. Um, in this poem, the speaker reflects on the failures of her past relationships, or perhaps just one specific relationship. Throughout the poem, nature imagery is used to show that the ending of a relationship is a natural thing, like the sun setting or the tide going out to sea. And that also suggests a sense of inevitability. So the speaker admits that she can't change the way she experiences love. She knows that her relationships will come to an end, just like all of these things in the natural world do. It's a Shakespearean sonnet, which is a traditional form for a love poem. It contains themes of both love and death, which are both um, often found in sonnets. And it follows the traditional pattern of a Shakespearean sonnet. So it has three quatrains and a final rhyming couplet, which go A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G. So there is that sense of um, a cycle or a, or a rhythm or um, a sense of order and routine. Um, which ties in with what she's uh, saying about the natural world and about how it follows this pattern. Um, the poem, because it's a sonnet, is written in iambic pentameter, but that rhythm is broken in a number of places. So despite that sense of um, consistency and a pattern and, and a sense of rules, there is also um, a slight sense of uneasiness and uncertainty uh, reflected in the fact that uh, this is a poem about... The, the failures in relationships and the ending of relationships. Let's first of all just make sure that uh, we know what iambic pentameter means. Um, it's a term which we often use when we're talking about sonnets um, because traditional sonnets um, are written in this rhythm. It refers to the meter or the rhythm of a poem um, and we need to break the term down into its two segments. So firstly the iambic part of it uh, refers to the type of rhythm that each line contains. So an iambic rhythm is one where we have two syllables. The first is unstressed and the second is stressed. So it sounds like this, da dum. The pentameter part of this term means that there are five of those in each line. So it goes da dum, da dum, da dum, da dum, da dum. Have a look at this line which is taken from the poem and you'll see what I mean. At close of day no longer walks the sky. Now it's really important uh, to make sure that when you're talking about iambic pentameter in your essays, um, you're not just identifying it. It's not enough just to say this poem is written in iambic pentameter. You need to be able to do something with that knowledge. You need to show why it's important that the poem is written in iambic pentameter or look out for where the rhythm does not conform to those rules. So you could look out for lines where we don't open with a second stressed syllable. Maybe the, syllable, maybe the first syllable of the line will be stressed. Or you might look at where the iambic meter places emphasis on particular words in the line. For, for example, here, the second word of the line, close, is obviously very important because that word is stressed. So we know that this is a poem about endings because it's the close of day, it's the end of the day. So let's have a look at the first quatrain of the poem. Now immediately we can see an example of what I was just talking about. So the first um, words of the line break the iambic rhythm already. So even though we know that it's a sonnet, we know that it's going to be written in iambic pentameter, we have here what's called a trochaic substitution and that means that the stress rather than being placed on the second syllable, is placed on the first. So breaking the iambic rhythm straight away creates um, an uneasy or a melancholic tone. We also have emphasis on the word pity, interestingly, because the speaker is saying pity me not, but because the emphasis on the word pity, it perhaps suggests that maybe she does want us deep down to pity her, and that's something to think about. So she says, pity me not because the light of day at close of day no longer walks the sky. So here she's talking about uh, perhaps the fact that daylight brings happiness, but that doesn't last. And this is the start of um, a whole list of references to different natural cycles. So we've got the light of day at close of day no longer walks the sky. Here we've got um, beauties passed away from field to thicket as the year goes by. So all the way through she's comparing relationships to natural cycles like the rising and the setting of the sun and the changing of seasons. Here we've got field to thicket as the year goes by. 
We've also here got the theme of death, which creates a melancholic tone. She's perhaps suggesting that all things in nature come to an end, just as relationships do. Now here you'll notice that that phrase, pity me not, pity me not, is repeated uh, three times in the first couple of quatrains um, of the poem. Uh, so although I, I did say earlier the emphasis on the word pity might suggest that she truly does want us to pity her, um, we could also look at an alternative interpretation here. Because she's repeating those imperatives, it could suggest that the speaker is very strong-willed and very clearly does not want to be pitied. So in this second quatrain, she begins by saying, Pity me not the waning of the moon, nor that the ebbing tide goes out to sea. So she's referring to more natural cycles here, over which we have no control. We can't control the fact that the moon changes. We can't control the fact that the tide goes out to sea. And again, the Lexis here is always relating to the endings. She's talking about the waning of the moon, not the waxing of the moon. She's talking about the ebbing tide going out to sea, not coming in. So all the way through, we have this, um, again, it's the theme of death, and it's the, it's the idea of endings. She's focusing on cycles all the time, but only ever the end of those cycles, um, which again increases the melancholic tone of the poem. Now here we have a slight change in tone. She says, nor that a man's desire is hushed so soon. So here we've got a hint that the failure of relationships is perhaps the fault of the male party um, from her perspective. And then she suddenly actually addresses um, a particular person. She says, and you no longer look with love on me. Now, this is a good example of where the iambic rhythm places emphasis on the word you there. Um, and so the second person address shows us very clearly that the speaker is clearly addressing a former lover. Um, but despite that, there's no sense of a conversation here. There's no reply. There's no response to her. We know that she's alone. And that, again, increases the pathos. Um, I've also just shown you a key term here, which might be new to you. It's called emphatic positioning. That's when a word, um, or more than one word, is placed at a certain point in the line to create a particular effect. And you can see that here. We've got you at one end of the line and me all the way at the other end, which reflects the separation of the speaker from her former lover. In the third uh, quatrain, the speaker here emphasizes the reason that she doesn't want to be pitied. She says, this have I known always. And so here she's kind of summing up what it is that she wants to say. She completely understands the natural cycles of the world and she knows that relationships are the same. She personifies love by giving it a capital L, um, and that gives it power and importance. She's suggesting, perhaps, that love, too, is a part of nature over which we have no control. So just like the moon, the tides, the seasons, love is, is one of them. We can't do anything about it. It will come and go as it pleases. Um, and in these next lines, she gives a very contrasting reflection of the extent of love's power. So she's clearly giving it power and importance, and yet she gives us uh, very different senses of just how powerful love is. So at first she says, love is no more than the wide blossom which the wind assails. And so that metaphor suggests that love is vulnerable to outside forces. Love is just a blossom. Um, it's, it's free for the wind to take it wherever the wind wants to. But immediately after that, she says, love is no more than the great tide that treads the shifting shore. So the use of the word great there, the great tide, um, suggests that love can be powerful. Strewing fresh wreckage gathered in the gales. That suggests actually that love is quite destructive. So that verb strewing there gives a sense of something being carelessly thrown away, while gathered in the gales suggests that um, the wreckage, which could be perhaps what remains of the lovers, has been purposefully collected up just to be thrown away again. So actually, love here is, is being portrayed in quite a negative way, and that perhaps it's love itself which is damaging. And then we have the final rhyming couplet. Now, in a sonnet, uh, we have something called the volta, which is a point in the poem where a change of tone takes place. In a Shakespearean sonnet, the volta always comes before the final rhyming couplet. And so here we have a change of tone, as is traditional. 
Um, in this poem, the speaker is now admitting that she's unable to learn from her mistakes. So all the way through, she's been talking about how she knows the natural cycles of the world, she knows that the relationships are the same, um, and yet in this final rhyming couplet, she says that despite the fact that she knows that, um, her heart is unable to listen to her mind. So pity me that the heart is slow to learn what the swift mind beholds at every turn. She understands all of the things that she said, but her heart can't listen to her. And here, she repeats that phrase, pity me, except she doesn't have that final word, not. And so the reader is now reconsidering the speaker's position. She is undeniably affected by the end of the relationship. And the couplet here, because it rhymes, it creates that sense of finality. It suggests that she doesn't believe she's able to change. She, she knows that she's always going to be this way. She's always going to feel the same. Um, and she's never going to learn. And that ends the poem on, on a very melancholic um, and reflective tone.